Edgar Wright seemed a fitting antidote to the claims made against Marvel about forced comedy in a typically bland visual style. Perfecting intricate shots and exceptionally funny editing, whilst also being at the helm for some of the most highly regarded films of the 21st century, it's almost unfair to place his output alongside other modern day comedies. In fact, if you forced me to watch something like Free Guy and hook me up to a heart rate monitor, the results would coincide with an untimely passing. But let me take you back to the beginning, a little while before Edgar Wright, and long, long before the phrase Marvel Cinematic Universe, a time of recovery for humankind. Years removed from the biggest war in history, we were growing increasingly jealous of our own records. In September 1962, Ant-Man made his Marvel Comics debut in Tales to Astonish number 27, in what I assume was originally supposed to be a standalone story, considering the fact that Tales to Astonish usually produces isolated narratives, they would astonish even further by giving this freak a sequel. The original story concerned a young scientist named Henry Pym who invents a shrinking serum, joining a long lineage of heroes named after rather pointless creatures. What? He was far from the crime-fighting, high-octane Avenger that we would later go on to become acquainted with. At this point in time, without a deep knowledge of martial arts that the average mutant has blessed with in a Marvel story, he was probably only useful for, I don't know, removing crumbs from a computer keyboard or something. Keep in mind, this was the original Ant-Man, Hank Pym, the one played by Paul Rudd in the movie as Scott Lang, the second Ant-Man. When Marvel made the decision to centre their adaptation around what is essentially a second generation hero, it no doubt infuriated comic book aficionados all around the globe. And to that I say, well done. A few issues down the line, Ant-Man reappeared. His quirky adventures would see him mastering the fragile art of shrinking, in stark contrast with the first issue where he was still coming to grips with the serum, and in a sad state of events, resort to befriending tiny insects, poor fella, wearing what looks to be an android's flashlight on top of his head. Although his personal life would see a slight uptick in activity with the introduction of the Wasp, initially only partners in a working sense, they got married, and Hank would later form the Avengers alongside her. Scott Lang would make his first appearance in Avengers issue number 181, delving right into the action. We meet him just moments away from getting messed up by an enraged Wonder Man. It looks as though we have a fight on our hands. What I can only assume is a battle for relevance, his debut looks like it might be short-lived, as opposed to his future in which he will almost certainly be living short, but thankfully Tony Stark defuses this situation by informing Wonder Man that Scott is an employee, there to install a new security system. The next month, in issue number 47 of Marvel Premiere, we would receive a slightly more formal introduction, finding out that Scott Lang is a reformed criminal and an apparent electronics expert. In seemingly no time at all, he reverts back to a life of criminality, but for good reasons, stealing Hank Pym's Ant-Man suit in order to free the only doctor who can treat his ill daughter, eventually earning the approval of Hank who gives Scott Lang permission to become the next Ant-Man. From there, he would serve alongside the Avengers, temporarily form a new Fantastic Four, and mistakenly shrink Spider-Man. It must be so nerve-wracking living in this kind of universe, narrowly dodging bugs in fear that it might grow man-sized and retaliate by strangling you with your own arm. Throughout the late 1980s, in a bid to get some of his Marvel stories adapted for the big screen, Stanley decides to go all in on one of his favourite heroes. An unpopular decision at the time, but begins trying to get an Ant-Man movie off the ground. Producers aren't convinced neither are screenwriters, or anybody for that matter, and see no potential for the character at all. That is until 2000. Artisan Entertainment joins forces with Marvel to produce a series of movies centred around some of the more low-key comic book characters, such as Ant-Man, Longshot, Power Pack, and Morbius. You had 22 years to make a decent movie, pricks, what happened? The following year, despite having never made a big budget movie, let alone a superhero one, Edgar Wright met with Artisan Entertainment to discuss work on a possible Ant-Man movie, though his time on the brilliant surreal comedy Spaced no doubt plays a part in him getting the interview. Following a successful meeting, Wright and fellow filmmaker Joe Cornish began working on a treatment, which, it turns out, Artisan wasn't too fond of. Edgar Wright described it as having elements of crime and action, where Artisan wanted something a little more family-friendly. 
Depends what kind of family you're aiming for, really. The Gambinos would have loved it. In 2004, Kevin Feige met with Edgar Wright for the first time. The topic of discussion veered towards future projects, in which they discussed Wright's earlier idea for Ant-Man, and to Edgar's surprise, Big Kev was on board. In 2006, at San Diego Comic-Con, they went on to officially announce an upcoming Ant-Man movie. Wright said, There will be a prologue where you see Pym as Ant-Man in action in the 60s, in sort of Tales to Astonish mode basically, and then the contemporary sort of flash forward is Scott Lang's story, and how he comes to acquire the suit, how he crosses paths with Henry Pym. Over the next couple of years, production would move, or rather stumble forward, ironically a running theme throughout this whole process. The development at one point, which seemed quite promising, was beginning to unravel fairly quickly, though we do find out that the first draft of the screenplay includes Scott Lang, an elder Hank Pym, Pym's daughter Hope Van Dyne, and a villain named Graydon Clark. By 2010, Wright was in the midst of his Scott Pilgrim adaptation and was in no hurry regarding the production of Ant-Man, after effectively saying that his movie wasn't as important compared to Iron Man, Captain America, and those that made up the core members of the MCU, so he could take his time. But in February of that year, Stan Lee met with Wright to discuss his vision for the movie and took to Twitter to express his excitement and enthusiasm for the young director. Prior to the first Avengers film, rumours concerning the official lineup was obviously going to generate frustration among fans, who wanted to see their personal favourite hero up on the big screen, but once the full cast was revealed and Ant-Man was nowhere to be seen, Wright said, the chronology of it, or the way it works, wouldn't really fit in with what they do, though his co-writer Joe Cornish says, there was supposed to be an Ant-Man reference in the upcoming Thor movie, but it was removed last minute. By that point, the duo had completed several drafts of the script, and confirmed that it will be very loosely tied to the MCU, but admitted that they would prefer it to be separated from the extended universe. Then in 2011, Feige says that the movie is finally close to happening, and Wright essentially goes on to confirm this with a cryptic tweet. Pretty easy to decipher, this fucker is making an Ant-Man movie. Despite our relatively uneasy journey so far, we arrive at San Diego Comic Con, the year is 2012, the year of a supposed apocalypse if you remember, and Wright is in attendance to reveal test footage for his long-awaited Ant-Man movie. All in all, a really great development, and it shows just how close this thing was to actually happening. In October of that year, it was announced that the movie would release three years later, November 6th, 2015, with Feige saying, certainly set in the Marvel Universe, but it's also through the lens of Edgar Wright, which is the only reason we're making the movie. By October, Wright would once again post a behind the scenes look at his work so far. Meanwhile, presumably feeling very optimistic, the release date was moved from November 2015 to July of the same year. As far as the cast was concerned, Wright favoured the eventual role winner and Paul Rudd, whilst Marvel preferred the slightly younger Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I think both are great choices, but Rudd is more capable of pulling off comedy, and is just a really likeable person in general. He would eventually land the role, but production is once again delayed due to the fact that Wright has to begin work on the concluding film in its Cornetto trilogy, The World's End. This is because Eric Fellner, producer behind those films, was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer, and Wright had promised him a trilogy. Thankfully, Fellner did recover, and Wright would go on to make an incredible film. In 2014, he got back to work on Ant-Man. Feige was adamant on more revisions to the script, though Wright and Cornish disagreed, but after various meetings, they complied and wrote another draft. They also wrote a scene that looks set to be included at the end of Avengers Age of Ultron, kind of tying that movie in with theirs, but that idea was also scrapped. Feige demands another draft, but hands the script off to completely new writers, not including Wright or Cornish in the process at all. When they find out and read new additions to their own script, understandably, they are not too enthusiastic about it. Once and for all, this would lead to Edgar Wright's departure from the MCU, and Feige would later comment on this tough but probably sensible decision considering the time wasted, saying, We sat round a table, and we realised it was not working. A part of me wishes we could have figured that out in the eight years we were working on it. 
Joss Whedon, at the time employed by Marvel, would tweet a photo of himself with a cornetto, a symbol of support towards fellow director Edgar Wright, a meaningful gesture if the person behind it was anybody other than Joss fucking Whedon. Marvel are now in the market for a new director, and hire Peyton Reed, known primarily for his rom-coms. Cast members begin to leave one by one, just as Michael Douglas adds fuel to the fire by announcing that Janet Van Dyne, Hank Pym's wife in the comics, and the original Wasp won't be included in the movie. At last, the movie begins production. Now with a new director and updated cast, things are pretty smooth from here on out. Despite everything going against it, a rocky journey and the character's obscurity to a general audience, it would go on to make $519 million worldwide. Wright would go on to say, I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. I'm just happy that Stanley got to see one of his favourite heroes up on the big screen.